that means is that I provide CFO, CFO consulting to uh, small, small businesses on an individual hourly or daily basis. Also to uh, merger and acquisition intermediary work. In terms of uh, my background, this uh, the startup that the Dan and I are doing is a title company. So I've been involved in 11 startups. I've worked for uh, big companies and small companies. Uh, in terms of my, one of the things I'll be talking about today is the LinkedIn network. How many people have, are on LinkedIn here? Is anyone not on LinkedIn? Okay, good. So who has uh, who has their LinkedIn in map done? One, good. Anybody else? Two. All right. So LinkedIn in map is a graphical representation of your LinkedIn network. And so these uh, these colors here, as an example, are the the uh, connections that your contacts have with each other. And if you navigate down to the dot stage, there'll be names that appear. And if you uh, click on a name, it'll say who that name is connected to within your network. And so as we talk about uh, partnerships, having a network is essential to making progress and doing a partnership. Now, I'm going to make reference to a few uh, books and a few authors. And my goal here is to uh, stimulate your thinking so that you would go, go back and explore some of these other, some of these other things. Uh, the first one is Malcolm Gladwell. How many of you have uh, read Malcolm Gladwell's books? One, two, three. All right, so uh, he was made famous. He won a Pulitzer Prize for Tipping Point, which uh, is a subtitle of How Little Things Can Change and Make a Big Difference. In, in high growth businesses, which everyone here would be uh, engaged in creating a high growth business, it takes, according to Malcolm Gladwell, it takes three elements to make a high growth business. It takes a connector, like someone that has these uh, connections, knows who to talk to. It takes a salesman to know what to say, and it takes a maven who knows what they're talking about. Now, very rarely, you'll have all three of those people in the same person. Most, most commonly, you'll have a maven that knows what they're doing, a salesman who kind of knows what, what they're doing, who can deliver a message. And then you'll have a connector that says, oh, I, I know this person, this person, this person. So as you're, as you're thinking about strategic partnerships and your internal team of who you want to, uh, you know, to go with you to try to make these connections, think in your mind, do I have those, do I have those three things? Now, the uh, uh, one week ago, Malcolm Gladwell released this new book, and I, I saw it, and I immediately uh, was captivated by it because I thought this is an interesting title: "Dating Lies, Underdogs, Misfits, and the Art of Battling Giants." Well, that seems to me to be what this is. Uh, this group is about uh, battling giants. Now, if you dig into this book, it's kind of interesting. There's uh, as Malcolm Gladwell does; he tells a lot of stories. And the, the David and Goliath one, uh, I'm sure everyone is familiar with David and Goliath, but do they know it in, in this way? You know, Goliath was uh, six feet nine. Some people, they've done some research and they're guessing that he was six feet nine, so he was a giant at the time. He was, uh, the, the, the scene was the, the Israelites were on one ridge and the Philistines were on the other ridge, and they sent their champion to see who would win the battle. All right. So Goliath comes, he's got he's got his full armor on, he's got his helmet, he's got his sword, he's got his shield bearer, and Saul, King Saul, uh, calls out and says, Who's going to champion Israel? 
and none of his guys show up, and this shepherd boy comes up, and he says, I'll do it. And so Saul tries to give him a, a, a sword. He tries to give him a shield. He said, I don't, I don't need that. And so uh, David walks down. Goliath begins to see David, and he says, what is this? Why is, why is this kid coming to uh, battle? Where's your, where's your warrior? And, uh, as, you know, the rest of the story, uh, David has picked up five sons. He swings him around. He hits Goliath in the head, and he knocks him dead, cuts off his head, holds it up, and they win. Now, how does that relate to what we're talking about here? Uh, an underdog has a tremendous advantage over giants, and we don't know, we don't normally think that to be the case. But if you if you dig down a little bit in this uh, this uh, anecdote, this Bible story, actually not the Bible story, you'll see that that uh, the the fight between Goliath and David was just about the same as between Goliath and somebody with a Glock 45 uh, handgun, because in the ancient days, a slinger could hit a bird in the air 50 or 100 yards, even 100 yards away. And so it's a, it's a deceptive thing. And one, one, one of the things I want to encourage uh, everyone here as they think about uh, their own giants that they might face is that giants have weaknesses and underdogs have strengths. In fact, uh, in fact, uh, Malcolm Gladwell quotes in his book that uh, in the last 200 years, in wars between nations, where one nation has 10 times the population of the other nation, the, the nation with the lesser population won 71% of the time. It's a very unexpected statistic. So I want to encourage you to... Uh, uh, if you're if you're on a pursuit of uh, fighting giants, uh, to to read this book and to get some some encouragement from uh, from his his theme there. Uh, how many of you have read the book uh, Good to Great? One. Okay. Uh, very popular. Well, probably one of the most influential business books in the last uh, 15, 20 years. Uh, Good to Great studies the uh, characteristics of companies that outperform others by a multiple of 5 to 10 to 1. So they would take stock prices in a peer group, and within the same industry, they would uh, identify those companies that performed 5 to 10 times better than their peers. And they reduced it to some characteristics. And I'm not, go I'm not going to try to uh, teach good to great here, but basically, Leadership, something he calls the hedgehog concept, which is about competence, creating a culture of di a discipline, and what he calls the flywheel concept. So again, I don't want to I don't want to give a, a course on good to great, but I do want to encourage you to take a look at this book and see if you can grab models and and apply them to your own uh, business situation to see how how are you doing. The, the, the last one that I'll point out, which is um, in terms of a, of a good model to follow, how many of y'all are familiar with uh, Stephen Covey? Everyone? Uh, habits, uh, he wrote the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. It sold millions and millions of copies. It was published in uh, probably 89, something like that. Stephen Covey has I think probably 10 kids, 12 kids. One of them is Stephen M. R. Covey. Stephen M. R. Covey. And Stephen M. R. Covey has become famous for his work on trust. Now, I don't have his, I don't have his, uh, his book on here, but his, his book is called The Speed of Trust. And in, in building strategic partnerships, Trust is a major accelerator. You're in a business accelerator here, but trust is a major accelerator in making things happen. And so as you think about your own uh, ethics and business practices, if you can see a smart idea, grab hold of that idea as, as opposed to maybe in, inventing your own. 
So I'm just going to swing through these a little bit. Uh, in, in these, uh, and by the way, I'll have, if you send me an email, I'll, I'll send you these, uh, these slides here. But these are, I'm going to go through these quickly, but these are 13 behaviors. What does it mean to talk straight? What does it mean to do the opposite of this? What is a, what is a counterfeit behavior? You know, what do you say? So these are, uh, these are uh, hints by experienced uh, business people and, or researchers in how to have a behavior which creates trust within people that you talk to. So you're not going to be surprised by any of these. Talk straight. Be respectful. Be transparent. If you do something wrong, try to make it right. Show loyalty, which means that if, if you're going to say something bad about somebody, try to bring them into the room and don't talk behind their back. Be loyal to people, particularly that you, that you work with. You should be loyal to anyone in terms of that behavior. you got to deliver results because if you've got all these other good things happening and you're not a producer, it won't matter. Yeah, constantly getting better, that's a, that's a good one. Now... Uh, confronting reality, we all have setbacks that we experience, and I'm going to talk about some setbacks in some uh, real strategic partnerships that I've been involved in. Uh, but when you when you have a setback, sometimes you just need to look your partner in that. Dan and I have had these. You know, he said it to me, and I've said it to him as we've uh, come together to try to build this uh, significant business. But you've got to be able to talk straight with people and look them in the eye and tell them what you see as the reality. What do you expect? Uh, not what do you expect, but clarify your expectations of others. Be accountable. Now, uh, how many here were at Richard Lerner's talk, uh, the Founders talk a few weeks ago? Anybody here? Uh, Richard Lerner? Okay. Well, I tell you, you missed a great talk because Richard Lerner is... Uh, has done five big startups, and he has, I think he's been successful in all of them. He told me something that is very counterintuitive that I've never heard before, and that is that the, the, a board of directors, everyone, even if you own, in Dan's case, he, he owns uh, maybe 80% of this company as it stands now, or 90%, I don't know, it's a lot. But even Dan, I'm going to pick on Dave because he's my friend. He has to be accountable to somebody. And I've got another client, and it's a sad story because he's got a neat idea. And he's a majority owner. He's not accountable to anybody. So anybody here who's a CEO or a majority shareholder, or if you're not a majority shareholder, encourage those, uh, those uh, people to be accountable to the stakeholders in the organization. So now I'm going to talk about a strategic partnership that went bad because there wasn't accountability. I was involved in, uh, with, with one of my clients. We got, we got a dream uh, strategic partner, Silicon Valley, uh, super well-funded. Uh, they, they, last year they got uh, Bain Capital put in $238 million dollars in this tech company. It's pretty good. And they wanted us. They, and they had our team out there. We, you know, we, we had uh, glassy eyes and we went and we sat with the, the president. They, they were, I think there were six or seven of them in their, in their uh, board. If you walk through their offices, it was really kind of reminiscent of, of this. There were whiteboards everywhere, conference rooms, and, and that sort of thing. Well, in that, in that strategic partnership that we were engaged in discussions with them, they started missing deadlines about how they were going to follow up with us. And, and, and the message is in strategic partnerships, when you have somebody that you just, oh, the perfect person has come along. This is great. We've made it. We're, you know, I, I could just cash my checks right now uh, that this is going to be fantastic. And once they started missing deadlines, we didn't go back to them. And this was my fault. I, I was certainly at fault, but I should have gone back to that guy and said, you know what, you said you had a deadline here, you were going to give something in a week, and it's turned into three weeks. Well, about two months later, 
they got back to us and finally they said, you know, our board of directors has met and we, we really, um, we're going to go a different way. You, you're a brick and mortar business, we're an online business, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to go forward. So we lost two months and we took our eye off the ball. So as you think about strategic partnerships, even that beautiful one that comes along, one of the uh, one of the companies that, that I was involved in, uh, this this was this was really a heartbreaker. Uh, let's see if I can uh, I can step. Let's see which one was this one, Soraya Biotech. This was a startup uh, biotech. Genentech wanted our technology. I thought they said they sent the NDAs. We had this, the 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 talks with the scientists. I was thinking, this is going to be fantastic. But you know what? They just wanted to know what we were doing. And we had that conversation with a few others. So I just want to uh, urge caution without throwing a wet blanket on things. That when you have a strategic uh, partnership opportunity, to really, among yourselves, think, do I really, are they really serious? Are they, are, are, are they just trying to find out what they're doing? You know, do I really fit into their, you know, to their picture? You know, now, uh, in in the case of uh, in the case of something, I won't say too much about what we're doing because it's a little secret, it's not real. But um, we we are building a business where we are reaching out and getting. We I bet I predict that in the next three months we'll have ten strategic partners in our business. And they're going to give us money, and they're going to give us business. And so I, I encourage you not to limit yourself to thinking, okay, I've got to have the Genentech, or I've got to have the Square Trade, or I've got to have the big, the big name. So you can you can uh, acquire those partnerships to fulfill certain purposes. In our case, we want to have a strategic partnership that's an extension of the business development activities of our company. And that's that's where our that's where that partnership comes in. I'll get off my uh, my my stars, particularly particularly this one right here. I hope y'all can't read that. I'm just gonna go back to this this page right here. All right, so I wanted to tell a story about a. Uh, a capital fund that was a, is, is in a way is a strategic partnership. When you're when you're looking for money, has anybody here ever looked for money uh, for to be able to invest in what they were doing? Anyone? I, I hope everybody would raise their hands if you had. If you're not looking for money now, you uh, uh, you should be looking for it at some point in the future. All right. So the the story I want to tell you is about a, a VC opportunity that I had. I was working with a software company and they had a really they had a really neat idea and they had two venture capitalists, two strategic partners that wanted to put money in. And it's, it was really it was really interesting because even though one uh, VC was in Dallas and one was in Boston, they came up with the same numbers. 6535. And they were gonna put it, they're gonna put it, they're gonna both put in seven million dollars. And they both both had sixty-five thirty-five, but there was only one difference between those two. One wanted sixty-five percent of their business, and the other wanted thirty-five percent of the business. So, you know, what's what's the message there? The message, what's the message? It's competition. It's having more than one option. And uh, you know, we we have faced this as we built this particular company, this uh, this title venture. I believe that that uh, the competition between the people that we've talked to has enhanced our ability to close a sale. I, I think that's true, and I think that's that's really going to be true because when we do these strategic partnerships for business development, let me tell you what our deal is a good deal, and it, it proves out. And people are going to want to get in. And we've only got ten slots. So, as you are going out seeking those strategic partnerships, particularly for money, be uh, 
try to have a competitive situation and see what is the best thing. And it's not always the most money. I'll give you another example. Within that same deal, some of you are old enough to remember maybe compact computers. Anybody remember the name compact computers? Okay. okay. Compact computers. Well, compact computers put up $5 million in this venture but to gain access to a certain bit of the technology. $5 million. They didn't get ownership. They just got a license to an aspect of the technology, the storage management technology that the company was developing. And do you know what? I, this is a sad story. You know what? It's sad for me. Uh, does anybody remember uh, when the tech bubble burst? You might. Does anybody else remember what, what month was it? When, what month and year? Uh, it was 2000. It was the, mar the bubble, the peak of the NASDAQ was in March of 2000. Okay. Now, the, the, uh, with one of the startups that I was involved in, which was, which was this one, U.S. Medical Lines, that one right there. We went hunting for capital uh, in uh, November of 99. That was the end of the Internet. Movement. It was over. We just didn't know it because we got all these appointments. I mean, we, we had a blue chip idea of the medical director, Mindy Anderson, brilliant guy, worthy purpose. We thought it was really going to be some kind of like in web MD or something like that. We couldn't get the appointments. So in a four month period of time, between really five months, between November and March, the market totally collapsed. So what's the message there as it relates to strategic partnerships? You have a moment in time, and I, I think I have, I, I hope I have this one thing, because this is kind of, I think this is kind of good. Let me just see if I can find it. Uh, bear with me just a second. The, oh, there we go. Are y'all y'all familiar with the UCF Mentor Network, right? Yeah. Okay, these are these are cool people, and they help they help entrepreneurs. But I love this quote: "Entrepreneurial journey is like jumping off a cliff, assembling a plane on the way down." Okay, so if, if as it relates to strategic partnerships. You got to move quickly. There's opportunities that we have that uh, we won't we won't have six months from now. Whether it's people, companies, whatever the case might be. So, as it relates to developing strategic partners partnerships, realize that in, in fact when when we walked out of the that Silicon Valley uh, company that had raised 239 million dollars and we thought it was the answer to all of our prayers and aspirations. Probably the, the, there may have been something that we could have done as the candle, and, you know, as we were pulling down, the, you know, jumping off, the, jumping off the cliff. You just have a limited period of time to take advantage of an opportunity to put together a strategic partnership. So I thought I thought that was a I thought that was an excellent uh, graphic and a, and a real graphic. Let's see if I have any. Oh. This is a little bit. This is a little bit out of order, but uh, uh, I'll I'll do this. Uh, the, I'll go back to the computer company again. Real life case. How much? I've got a question here. How much is a company worth that has no money, that has twenty million in revenue, and thirty-five million dollars in expense? How much is it worth? 20 million in revenue, 35 million in expense, and very little cash. How much is it worth? Could be 100 million. That's it. That's 100 million. Okay. So, uh, high ground storage, the company I was involved in a little bit in the beginning, we got the compact money and got the, uh, we got the money from Boston. Sun Microsystems paid $100 million for their technology. 
and uh, it is, I mean, it, we, we were close. I mean, you can imagine when you're burning 15 million more a year than you're bringing in and you're running out of cash, but they needed an aspect of that, of that technology. So the part two to that story, and that was a great guess. Uh, I want to say something about that in just a second. But, uh, the part two of that was that they can buy you with money or stock, right? What's better? Blend. Blend is probably better. I mean, it's or a collar or something, you know, something along those lines. Because when when we were throwing a party to get a hundred million dollars. In December, uh, I was I was in Rotterdam at the time, and I got the news that this is going on. I thought, this is great. Uh, December 19, 1999. My little piece of I did a little bit of consulting in the beginning was worth three hundred thousand dollars. Well, what happened to Sun Microsystems stock between December nineteenth and April fifteenth when I got the stock in my hands? You know, it went to fifteen dollars a year. So. As you're, you know, I'm trying to say something about strategic partnerships. You've got to be opportunistic. You've got to realize the environment. You got to have a team of people that can assess these things. You're jumping off a cliff. Uh, you you got to, you kind of got to work fast. You got to have a, a, a combination of the maven, the mavens, the salesman, and the con connector, and you can do very well and have a lot of success. So I think that's. Uh, Pretty much what I wanted to talk about. I would like to answer any questions, or if anybody has any comments, I'd be happy to do that. Go ahead. Hi, hi, Jamie. Um, I um, I'm struck by a couple of good things that you said because I'm in the midst of making the assessments of with whom I need to align. Good. And I was wondering how you decide or what kind of assessment you make or in your experience um, to um, to establish who and who is not trustworthy. Oh. And I say that because you stifle your possibilities if you don't trust, right? But then you do trust and then you are in a more dangerous place. So that I is, wanna that is that is a great that, that is a great idea right there. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to refer to this right here, which says uh, there's a couple here. Getting those who who don't trust others to extend trust to you, uh, restoring trust when you've lost their trust, developing trust with others, developing trust with someone that you don't trust, and so. Uh, the, 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 the long answer is please go out and take a look at, you know, let me send you this stuff and, and get a look at these cue cards because if you can develop a decent trust relationship with someone, you're going to accomplish things a whole lot faster. But not everybody in this world has a halo one. In fact, there's many that don't. Okay. And so you have to, you have to adopt techniques that allow you to have accountability, to have milestones, because you're going to need people that don't fit your uh, morality. Maybe the right term. Ethics may be a better, uh, better term. Go ahead, please. Yeah, my main su uh, suggestion, the objective things you can do, please check your bathroom. You know, they have a history. They probably got a limited place. They've had to work with other companies. They have a portfolio. Find out. Research the people they dealt with before and get their lean on it. Or you could even do criminal background checks on them if you're concerned about that for a couple of dollars. That's certainly you know, that's certainly part of it. I, I think that uh, you know, developing a good system of, of personal assessment that is more than just your gut feeling. Now, gut feelings are are also uh, real good because there's uh, when Malcolm Blank all in the books that I didn't uh, bring up of his, it's called Blink, which is the uh, ability of people to make an instant assessment that turns out to be true, and they almost don't know why it is. It's the intuition, it's this combination of cognitive things. But, you know, um, th these cards are not hokey as it relates to uh, creating a strategy of dealing with people that, that are in that area. You trust them, they don't trust you. 
that you don't trust. You know all the all the very all the variables that that might be. Go ahead, please. I'd say utilize a trust collaborator, um, even if they're not your partner. Someone you trust and bounce off ideas and it's, um, stimulates your own thinking. If you're all by yourself all the time. You've got you know, one track. But in talking it out, like Nathan and I, I'll, I'll change my mind. I'm just talking it out with someone. Yeah, I accept that. Um, one of the one of the struggles that I've seen in in this field in the networking that I've done is that there seems to be this sort of lack of accountability issue. And unless you go to some of the bigger firms, or unless you commit a significant amount, you know, more money towards creating a project, um, you know, it's it's at the cost of delivering the goods. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, and I can't imagine that that's always the case, right? But that's sort of the reputation that's had. Um, so that's what I'm trying to figure out to make that assessment right now. Do I go with a bigger firm or? You know, I have a suggestion for you on that. You know, I would think in terms of people instead of firms. Firms are in, you know, people are in firms. Yeah. But it's. Uh, but it's the commitments that the firms make and the identities that those people represent as a whole, which makes the delivery mechanism more solid. I I, I think that I I, I can understand what you're saying. Yeah. My experience is that. If you get a good person yeah. that's a professional or that is someone you're dealing with, and and they are committed to it, even if even if their firm is lukewarm or not seeing the benefit, if you get someone that is committed, you know that, that you can really believe is committed to your thing, and you got to come up with uh, things that win for them also, but uh, you know they're just individual, they're just certain individual personalities. That um, are worth dealing with, and they'll they'll work hard. They won't give up, you know, etc. Et that's my that's my thought. Stress the benefit of being involved from the very beginning, where a big firm has a percent priority to them, very very small, but to an individual, it can represent an exponential sure. larger future. Yeah, that's that's a that's a good point. You know, when when uh, when I pitch my services. I'll talk about my successes and my failures of things I've been involved in. Frankly, the, the failures have probably been just as valuable as the, or more valuable than the successes. Any other uh, thoughts? Yes? One of the key uh, elements of building trust is the ability to listen. So I would suggest that you figure out whether they're really listening to you and if you rank them, who listens with the greater skill and the greater depth. Yeah, I think that's. I think it's. In fact, that's uh, on this list. I think it's number twelve or, or thirteen. And you know, uh, uh, with these these cards, I think are real interesting because if you if you buy into these as a code of ethics yourself towards a trust environment, I, I think it's pretty pretty powerful to be able to articulate. You can say to someone, "I'm transparent with you. I'm going to hold you accountable. I'm going to deliver results." You can kind of go into that. That thing, it's not, it's not mobile job It's really, if you believe it, it can, whatever you can do to bring, our topic is strategic partnerships, right? whatever you can do to get someone on your team and helping you is, I mean, that you need, you're, you've jumped off the cliff, most of us have, you know, as we're, as we're going to start. So. Anything else? All right, well, uh, I don't know how long we've talked, but uh, what, what time is it? It's supposed to be a half hour. Does anybody else has any other questions? Um, so we have a lot of partnerships with the uh, local banks and the uh, chain of promises. Uh -huh. And our issue is, I might be really sure to talk about this, it's very hard to get them to take this partnership as like a level one initiative. Uh -huh. It becomes this additional resource. Like we're doing everything that's not like the number one goal. Mm -hmm. So how do we drive kind of that? Mm -hmm. Well, um, one of the, uh, the internet, the internet boom in the late nineties was really a, a very interesting period because it, it kind of dealt with this in a lot of ways. A lot of ways. One of the prominent authors at that time, his name was Jeffrey Moore, with a G, Jeffrey Moore, 
He wrote a book called Crossing the Chasm. Has anybody ever heard of Crossing the Chasm? Okay. So in, in Crossing the Chasm, uh, to get to a high growth stage, you create your niche that you are so outstanding. So if you have if you have ten of these partnerships, if you if you can have make sure that, that one is just so outstanding that it uh, builds this reputation uh subcommittee calls it the long tail. Uh, so to build this beachhead where you have such an outstanding track record. Find someone that's really interested in what you're doing that you can invest some time in. Because it's a, uh, it's a misconception that you need to start many things uh, and do them, you know, something's going to hit. If you, if you develop a real success with one, when people adopt something new, one of the first things they want to say is, where is it working? And, and you don't want to say, in fact, uh, uh, in the early uh, times of the uh, internet boom, people would say, well, the market is $10 billion. If I just get 1% of the $10 billion market, I get $100 million in revenue, and I'm going to do a 20% EBITDA, and then let's see, and there's going to be a growth factor here. I've already created $100 million, and I'm out of here. All right, well, there's only one problem with it. Nobody wants to buy a product that has a 1% market share. People want to buy a product that has a high market share. And so how can you, as an underdog, as a little guy, as David and Goliath, uh, you know, get that? You niche into it as narrow a niche that makes you truly great, that, that, that has that great success story. And you will find, uh, in fact, we, we found this. People are beginning to find out what we're doing, and they want to be on our team because of the ones that we have we have started to associate with. So who's in your deal? So and so and so and so. So, so. so when you can uh, can create that really great relationship with one or two, then it's just gonna it's just gonna snowball. That's my that's my. Opinion. Anybody have any thoughts about that? Uh, just got a, a question. Could you talk briefly about your most successful? Um, Alliance with partnerships. Sure. Um, well, let me let me look at my. Uh, let me look at my uh, thing here. I guess you know probably probably high ground storage, which was started as a startup with you know four guys around the table, did sell for a hundred million. Uh, had a lot of VC along the way. That was, uh, you know, I, I, pro I probably should come up with some some things. I learned a lot more from the ones that, you know, that didn't work. I mean, let me tell you this: to Rob Isaac, I got through uh, three levels of FDA process, IND, phase one, and phase two, and it died. That could have saved, that could have helped millions of people that suffer from psoriasis. And and it, you know, so. I, I I don't know quite how to answer. I'm not quite prepared to answer that. I wish I, I wish I had thought about that. But uh, I think the, what I'm, what I'm searching for is when do you start to get the feeling or the awareness that this group is a uh, great potential? Well, I think if you I think if you uh, assemble you know the good to great thing here about a team. And, and those those Jim Collins uh, things, and you overlay that the Malcolm Gladwell connectors, salesman, and, and Maven, you know between those two philosophies, reading Gladwell's David and Goliath to realize that you really aren't that David really is the favorite. They don't know it, but he is. Uh, and so I think between those and you and you overlay the Covey Trust material with how to personally conduct yourself and how to hold people accountable. I don't know. That's Strategic uh, uh, that's that's uh, Dan just mentioned another book uh, that, that uh, I love this one. I can talk about it in two minutes. Strategic intuition is a is a book about military history, and and it's about the history of the uh, changes in scientific revolution. The 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 real breakthroughs that have occurred in what we're trying to do here is when you combine. 
uh, different elements that are existing in the marketplace into something new that has never been used before, never been seen before. Those are where the real breakthroughs. And so uh, the the irony is, and I don't think you bring this up again, we talk about strategic planning. Everybody's heard about strategic planning. You see the goal, then you work backwards about how to get to the goal. That's the biggest fact. We read strategic duration, you see how people have really made it. That's wrong. And it's, it's, it's heresy to say that that's not what you do. But strategic intuition says that you look every day at the opportunities that are in front of you, and you pick the ones where you can make a difference, as opposed to saying, we're going to be 40 million sales or 100 million sales. You know, that's how breakthroughs have occurred, is the combining of ideas or resources that have not been brought together before and not thinking, in fact, what killed Napoleon is when he set the destination of Moscow, and it, 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 uh, he started, my, my uh, great, 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 great grandfather, Philip Harsh von Oppenheim, was with Napoleon when he went to, uh, to Moscow. They started with 500,000 people, and they ended with 50. Can you imagine? 50,000? 90% of those people died. Because Napoleon changed his philosophy. Napoleon used to be, earlier in his, in, his, in his war career, he would opportunistically pick the battles where he would be successful. And he was successful be, you know, just beyond anybody's imagination. Until he said, you know what, I'm going to go to Moscow. I don't care, I don't care what the weather's like. I don't care. You know, what, you know, and, 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 and can you imagine yourself doing the same thing when you're creating your, com your companies? And you say, you know what, I'm going to get, I'm going to do this idea. In fact, I will say one other thing. The, the ideas that you come up with, you start with, uh, our idea is not the same that we, that we started with. When we started coming up with this, but along the way, we opportunistically came up with what turned out to be a pretty darn good idea. We adapted. Thank you, Chris. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you everyone for coming out uh, next week for our Founders Talk.